Hello from the Ronald Reagan Minuteman Missile State Historic Site. My name is Rob. I'm the site supervisor out here. Um, you know, since we can't have visitors right now, we decided, hey, we'll make some videos and hopefully reach out to you. So today we're going to talk a little bit about a subject that's really interesting to me anyway. Uh, the communication systems that were set up at the site to ensure um, the sites could communicate with the National Command Authorities, um, Strategic Air Command Headquarters in Omaha, Nebraska, and just the great amount of redundancy uh, that were built into these systems. You know, everything from the basic phone line all the way up to satellites to make sure this site was connected and also would prove to a potential adversary that, hey, you know, they're gonna knock out the satellites. They can still get a hold of Oscar Zero via radio or telephone. You cut the phone line. You know, you got the satellites again. So it was a very important part of the nuclear deterrent was proving that, you know, you could try to take out these sites, but there was so much built into them that it would just about be impossible. So let's get into it. Um, we have a, a picture of the communications network as at least the late 1990s. Um, you know, Oscar Zero never got to the React console. Um, it was retired before then, but it kind of shows you just the amount of technology and, uh, you know, radio frequencies that were used to communicate with this site to make sure you got from Stratcom, um, you know, by 1992, it was Stratcom down there in Omaha. And even from there, you're going to the National Command Authorities, the Pentagon, Joint Chiefs, the President. So from Stratcom, and even there, there's, al there's alternate methods as well. It really gets, can get convoluted. Um, the basic uh, communications channel was telephone, uh, leased telephone lines. In the 1950s, there was a lot of efforts to make those lines a little more redundant, a little more hardened. So um, throughout the United States, it's uh, a great amount of uh, effort and money was invested in that infrastructure. Um, basically, you're going on from coax cables to uh, fiber optics uh, by the 1980s. So in the 1960s, meanwhile, <clears throat> excuse me, Strategic Air Command invested in something called SACS, the Strategic Automated Command and Control System that would basically allow the commander back there in Omaha to understand the force readiness and what was going on at Strategic Air Command bases, hopefully throughout the world. You know, in the 1960s, this is a fairly new science. It didn't work the greatest. Um, it was tied into the worldwide uh, military command and control system that had some flaws to it in the 1960s. Uh, basically, there were some uh, major events uh, that were, you know, that didn't make the system look very good. So from there, um, they also had radio backups. Um, initially, the high-frequency radio but also uh, aircraft, uh, that ultra high frequency antenna, um, also low frequency uh, trailing antennas from these aircraft, and then into satellites by the 1970s. In fact, today, uh, satellites are a key part of the communication system uh, with uh, strategic forces. So uh, they talk a little bit about the Hicks cable down here, um, hardened intersite cabling system. That was how these sites communicated with, uh, you know, the launch control centers, one out to the launch facilities. Um, the hardened voice channel, the emergency world order network, basically to the smallest extent possible, Strategic Air Command really wanted everyone to get the message to, uh, you know, potentially launch. And that was, again, as part of that nuclear deterrent. Um, it, it was just a very, very complex system. So we'll look a little bit about the electromagnetic spectrum here. Uh, you know, something you might remember from college. Um, it's interesting to point out that uh, uh, Oscar Zero, excuse me, were using channels throughout this whole area, all the way from VLF, that low frequency, uh, very low frequency, excuse me, to the super high frequency uh, satellite communications later on. So each of these had their benefits, each of them had their uh, drawbacks, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But, you know, on that radio spectrum, it's interesting to point out how, like, you know, you go to infrared, like a remote control uh, the visible spectrum where we see light, ultraviolet um, rays, x-rays, gamma rays, you know, it's, there's so much to learn about that. Um, so it, it um, kind of makes me miss that I uh, didn't, I took chemistry in high school, I didn't take physics, but it sounds like there's a lot to learn about, um, you know, the electromagnetic spectrum, it's just fascinating. 
So we'll start at the very bottom here, very low frequency, the low frequency radio. Basically in the 1960s, the Air Force was determining that there was a phenomenon known as electromagnetic pulse that could be emitted by uh, nuclear explosions in the atmosphere. It's kind of interesting because in 1962, I believe, uh, Operation Dominic in the South Pacific, they were detonating uh, weapons in the high atmosphere using Thor rockets, um, Thor missiles, I should say. Um, but they were flying C-135 aircraft nearby, and uh, basically they thought they were far enough away, but that EMP was wreaking havoc on the electronics in that C-135. It was knocking out streetlights in Honolulu, Hawaii. I mean, burglar alarms were going off. Um, it was something that wasn't well known, and a lot of interest went into it in the 1960s. Uh, it became a very huge concern with communications, and something called, um, it'd be called nuclear blackout, because basically, with high frequency radio, we'll talk a little bit more about that, you know, if there's problems in the ionosphere, um, it, the range was just cut down, you couldn't communicate for minutes or possibly hours, um, you know, if nuclear weapons had been detonated. And it's kind of the same thing with natural phenomenon as like, uh, you know, like an aurora could really disrupt high frequency radio. So they went to the low frequency. Um, it's a lot more redundant, it's a lot more resilient in the nuclear environment, I should say. It's penetrating. So the antenna actually is, we think it's out here. It's at a 90 degree angle, um, but it's buried beneath the so uh, soil there. Um, but. VLF and LF uh, was also a way to talk to submarines out in the uh, ocean um, because it's penetrating into soils or water or salt water. Um, this antenna here is actually for satellite TV and something we really wish would still work today. But basically that low frequency uh, system, it really came online in the late 1960s. Um, down in Nebraska, I got a chance to drive by this site by Silver Creek, Nebraska long since abandoned. I think they abandoned it in 92, but there used to be a super, uh, a big, I should, shouldn't say super, I'm getting terms confused here, but a very tall antenna that would transmit that low frequency message. The thing is, you know, what's penetrating, it's, you know, it, it can go for a long distance and go through that nuclear environment. The only problem is um, it was very slow data rate. Uh, you talk to the missileers here, the Slifix rack downstairs that you know, SLFCS, um, they said it was like kind of a slow printer. It would just go to chunk, to chunk, to chunk. Um, so you'd get the message eventually, it would just take a while. So um, they had a site down in Silver Creek. They also had one out in California for a while. Um, Slifix, the mission was basically written off by the mid 1990s, late 90s, I want to say. But um, airborne uh, control aircraft, such as the EC-135, or the E-4 actually had a trailing wire antenna that was, I believe, about a mile long. It created a tremendous amount of drag on those aircraft, but you needed a really long antenna to transmit on the low frequency spectrum. Medium frequency kind of is a little different. Um, the range wasn't super far. It was fairly similar to AM radio um, in that uh, frequency uh, spectrum but it was a way for Grand Forks sites and it was kind of unique to these sites um, along with the single squadron up there in Montana you never want to forget that um, to send the launch commands and uh, basically pick up maintenance messages to the launch facility so these are 3 to 18 miles away but at all the other sites uh, all the other missile wings they used HICS the hardened interstate cabling system well, Grand Forks had Hicks, but they also had that medium frequency radio. So that was a way, um, a redundancy, to be able to launch those missiles just in case those Hicks cables had been disabled somehow. So uh, medium frequency was basically out of service by about 2008 when that 564th Missile Squadron uh, deactivated, uh, and it's no longer in use. High frequency radio, um, this isn't the best picture, I just like the sunset thing looking here. Um, if I remember right, that was a really cold day. Uh, high frequency receiver antenna here that extended out of the ground. At the squadron command posts, or the alternate command posts, um, so like in the Grand Forks field, there were three squadron command posts, one for each squadron. There was one alternate command post that was Mike Zero. They had a uh, transmitter, a hardened transmitter capability 
to talk to the other sites via high frequency radio, but um, they also had a soft configuration. It was called, it almost looked like a Christmas tree to some extent, um, outside uh, that could communicate with the sites. But the primary launch control centers, um, the other four basically within that squadron just had the receive capability. But the cool part about the receiver here is that it almost looks like kind of like a revolver. So if you had the inconvenience of a nuclear weapon going off nearby, you lost that antenna. Of course, it's sticking up. It's high drag. Um, you had four, five reloads, I believe. Um, so another one could be shot out with the push of a button by the command crew uh, downstairs in the capsule had they survived the nearby impact. Um, with the four, I want to say it was five reloads. Um, I think SAC was a little optimistic as far as how many nuclear hits they can take nearby. Um, but there again, that's a lot of redundancy to be able to communicate. The problem with high frequency radio, as we kind of mentioned before, were those electromagnetic pulses that could really mess up the atmosphere, um, the ionosphere, I should say, from communicating with long distances. Um, when everything was working, it would work out just great. Um, it was very long ranged. Um, problem is it couldn't be relied on to work in a nuclear environment. So it, the, the requirements kind of were phased up in the 1970s here. Ultra high frequency radio on the other hand, um, you know that was a big thing in the 1960s. Uh, line of sight communications um, with the control centers but also the launch uh, facilities, the silos themselves. So within this cone here, that's the transmitter and receiver, you had a concrete portion here, you had a fiberglass top, and the antenna was tucked away inside of that. So with that line of sight communications, that meant if you had an aircraft within about 200 miles, they could communicate with the launch control center here. Um, and then later on, that was a big thing with ultra high frequency uh, radio via the uh, fleet sats, uh, the fleet satellites that the uh, Air Force would lease some space off of with, with the Navy to communicate with these sites. I mean, as long as you're within line of sight, you can communicate. Um, to most extent. But um, basically, uh, ultra high frequency radio, the cool thing about that is that um, it would, they called it burn through a lot of the interference caused by nuclear weapons. And it was just another redundancy for aircraft. Hopefully, you know, if they're nearby, they could tell the launch control center to launch. If this launch control center was gone, if it had been hit, the launch facilities, like I said, had these antennas. So the cool thing in the night 1960s was they had a uh, airborne launch control center, um, the launch control s uh, system, excuse me, um, that they could turn the launch keys on those aircraft and remotely fire the missiles. And this is something fairly extraordinary for the late 1960s. Uh, that's a big advance in technology. Um, they went to Millstar satellites a little thereafter. Um, I believe they were also configured for super high frequency. But by the late 1980s, they had another um, redundancy installed. Uh, this is specifically built for satellite communications. It was the ICBM Super High Frequency Satellite Terminal. Um, these have been uh, phased out of service, but they were specifically built for those um, Millstar and I believe what was called DSCS satellites uh, to communicate with super high frequency radio, which was a little more again, uh, resilient to nuclear effects. Um, the Air Force has gone on from this. They have different systems nowadays. And uh, basically this is where they got to in the early late 80s, early 90s, as far as technology went at Oscar Zero. So uh, we're gonna end it there. Uh, we won't make this too long, but I uh, just wanted to mention, you know, people talk about the red phone, um, you know, at Strategic Air Command Headquarters, people would always think the red phone was the one used to talk to the president. Uh, that was actually a gold phone. Um, they would pick up the gold phone and they could talk to the National Command Authority, um, you know, the president, the Pentagon. Uh, there were some other different colored phones as well, but the red phone was something, there's some really cool videos out there, especially from the late 60s, where they pick up the red phone on this console and they'd make, you know, just a maintenance test and it would communicate with the SAC bases hopefully worldwide, but it was a way to instantly contact everybody, the primary alerting system. And uh, that's just, just very interesting that you could pick up a phone and contact, you know, dozens of bases at once and the launch control centers as well. And it just goes back to that redundancy.
couldn't pick up that phone. You know, again, phone lines are gone, radio, satellite. It was all about presenting uh, that credible nuclear deterrent. In fact, some people could argue that, you know, a part of the triad, there was the communications aspect of it too. You had the bombers, you had the submarines, you had the missiles, but without an effective communication system, none of that was gonna work. So even today, um, you know, there's still a lot of importance placed on it, of course. Uh, communications have just become such a huge part of our life. Um, I mean, I'm coming to you today via YouTube, uh, via the internet, and it's just something we find really interesting. So um, if you have any questions, uh, give us an email, shsoscar0 at nd.gov, or uh, be sure to look us up on Facebook. And from there, uh, again, my name is Rob, and we'll talk to you next time.